everybody yeah, it's okay. We, the Indian Society of Heating, Refrigerating and Air Conditioning Engineers, ISHRI, stand tall in the Indian industry with over 10,000 professionals as members and almost an equal number of student members. Founded in 1981 and headquartered in Delhi, we operate from chapters and sub-chapters spread all over India bringing our entire industry together. Individuals become members of our society according to their professional and academic standings. Our roadmap of the future looks very bright with thousands of new members joining this technical society every year and bringing in a fresh outlook to our industry intelligence. Ishre disseminates knowledge through its technical committees which consists of some of the best minds of our industry. It publishes technical books, newsletters, and a prestigious journal, distributing the wealth of knowledge to all its members. Working with government departments, ISHRE helps formalize industry codes and standards. ISHRE promotes research by offering financial support to student members to carry out groundbreaking work in technology, systems and processes. Our educational wing, ISHRE Institute of Excellence, organizes training programs and workshops to help members enhance their skill sets. Our specially designed certification programs under ICP, that is ISHRE Certified Professional, empower professionals to always be in step with the prevailing technology. Specially designed courses for technicians are offered to meet the ever-increasing demand for a skilled workforce. ISHRE organizes exhibitions, conferences, panel discussions and product presentations throughout the country. We organize the industry's largest international exposition in South Asia, Acrex India to showcase the cutting-edge technology, innovation and provide a platform for closer interactions amongst the decision makers in the industry. The Acrex exhibition is now growing from HVAC and R show into BFA, Build Fair Alliance. This brings together several allied shows connected with the building services industry all at one location. Our chapters organize several other popular events like AcriConf in Delhi, Raycon in Kolkata, Symposia in Mumbai, TechFest in Goa, and many more. We are committed to provide training and career guidance to our student members through seminars, lectures, quiz contests and site visits. AQuest, a prestigious quiz competition organized by ISHRE to catalyze the transformation of the budding engineering professionals. ISHRE provides a platform to potential employers to select student members for careers in HVAC and our industry at the ISHRE Job Junction. 
Young minds are made aware of the need for saving power, clean air and sustainability. The K-12 initiative of Ishray focuses attention on school students' development to inculcate a scientific fervor and help develop them into responsible citizens. Speedy information is imperative to keep moving forward in this hyper-connected digital age. Searcher A specifically designed search engine is now available which allows access to a well-catalogued database on HVACR and building services industry with just a few clicks. Ishray cooperates with various national and international bodies, industry, governments, academia, think tanks to promote the concept of sustainability, environmental protection and energy efficiency and conservation to enter and explore the universe of the Indian HVACR industry log on to ishray.in that unfolds a panorama of information let us engineer a sustainable future together through ishray Our world is changing. Cities are growing. Food is moving faster, further. And we want healthier, more comfortable lives. These changes are driving up the demand for energy. So who's enabling more energy efficient homes, cities and industries? Armacell. We understand the world's energy demands and engineer solutions that make a difference. Solutions that help save energy lower costs and reduce emissions. As a global leader in equipment insulation, we are tackling the energy challenge since the smallest things have the biggest impact. We manufacture equipment insulation, engineered foams and aerogel blankets, helping homes to optimize energy efficiency in solar applications skyscrapers to reduce energy losses in air conditioning and water piping, trains to provide fire-safe insulation, onshore pipelines to prevent corrosion under insulation, and wind turbines to make renewable energy production possible. We invest in new technologies, focus on superior product performance, and constantly innovate thinner, lighter, and more environmentally friendly products so we can help cities meet the needs of energy distribution and enhance living comfort through thermal and acoustic insulation. Our vision is shared by 3,000 employees around the world who make Armacell a trusted and reliable partner and support our customers in more than 100 countries where every individual has a passion to make a difference in our mission to enable a more energy efficient world. Discover how at Armacell.com A technology leader offering total fluid dynamics and handling solutions. KSB attributes the highest importance to optimal quality and customer care. Because for us, the customer is our world. KSB is that name that has been taming fluids for about a century and a half. With their long perfected solutions for every industry and for customers that need them. Established in 1871 in Germany, today the group has over 90 companies employing over 16,000 employees and with a turnover of over 2.3 billion euros and is one of the leaders in this field worldwide. Heir to this lofty tradition of technological leadership, KSP came into existence in India in 1960 with its first factory in Pimpri in Pune. Today, KSB in India manufactures and offers an illustrious star cast of pumps, valves, and a tight array of services from five ultra-modern factories across India. 
fulfilling the needs of a diverse and knowledgeable domestic and international customer base. And now, to cater to the growing demands of the energy sector, KSB is poised to set up yet another state-of-the-art manufacturing facility in Shirwal near Pune. So whether it is submersible pumps or pumps for nuclear reactors, several innovative solutions have made their debut on the shop floors of KSB in India with the objective of offering best suited solutions to our customers' needs and with the intention to be ahead of time all the time. When customers describe their needs, we listen intently. Sometimes it may mean a standard pump or a valve and sometimes a whole tailor-made solution. We have set for ourselves high standards often as high as the highest building for transporting water, fresh water, hot water, and even water for firefighting to a host of offices, airports, and industrial complexes. In the power sector, we help to produce more power with less fuel and ensure cost effectiveness in the most critical conditions. And that's why our excellence is energy in constant motion. In the petrochemical and refinery sector, our pumps and valves perform with choreographed finesse in handling hazardous and cryogenic liquids. Our products handle extreme pressures and temperatures effortlessly. Whether it is for handling water or aggressive and corrosive fluids or viscous and solid laden fluids in industrial processes. KSB pumps have been relentlessly working in the agriculture and irrigation sectors for decades, reliably supplying water to farms and fields across the length and breadth of the country. Even when it comes to pumping with non-conventional energy sources in rural India, we romance the life-giving element, water, with great panache. When it comes to handling wastewater and effluents, our products perform responsibly and with grace. Your wish to expect the best from us inspires us to keep innovating and offer the best to you. KSB, our technology, your success. And that's a promise. Uh, thank you and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we welcome you for this webinar technical talk on behalf of Delhi chapter of Israel. As we all know that today we are covering uh, a topic that is low approach cooling tower and adiabatic coolers. And we are happy that uh, we have uh, expert speaker for this, Mr. Sahab J. Ahmad. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for uh, taking the time out and uh, joining for this webinar. And of course, we are thankful for all the panelists. Uh, Valiula Sethi, sir, our program chair, Akash Saxena ji, our youth chair and all the panelists and all the attendees. Again, I would like to welcome all of you on behalf of Delhi Chapter of Israel. And of course, uh, without the help of uh, our annual partner, we cannot do such kind of program. And without the help of members, we cannot do, of course, such kind of program. So we are thankful to Arma Cell, Platinum Partner, Gold Partner, LP Reflex, KSB, Silver Partner, Briar, DRI System and Advanced Balls, Mavex, and annual partners, Andrews Hedro, Paramount Poetry, TFLX, and membership partner, Recreation. So, without further any delay, I request uh, uh, Mr. Akash Saxena to introduce uh, Saab Jayarmal in front of us in this program. Over to you, Saxena. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Tapas, sir. Hi, a very good evening, one and all. I welcome you all to today's technical talk low approach cooling towers and adiabatic coolers. So without any further ado, I would like to introduce the speaker for the day, Mr. Shahab Z. Ahmed. Mr. Ahmed is a BA Mechanical from Jamia Media Islamia, Delhi and MBA Marketing from IIT Delhi. He has over 26 years of experience in HVAC and R and thermal acoustic insulation products. He has worked in leadership position in various MNCs such as Blue Star, Voltas, Thermex, Basic and Rotors, VTS, ALP, etc. in India and Middle East as well. He is also a member of Ustre and Ashre India chapter and is currently working as GM Sales at Paharpur Cooling Towers Limited, New Delhi. So without any further delay, I request Mr. Ahmed to please begin the technical talk, sir.
over to you sir yeah thank you friends and uh, good evening everyone uh, i would like to thank uh, the lead chapter of hra and all the panelists on board as well as the program sponsors for giving me this topic uh, to talk about uh, low approach cooling towers and adiabatic coolers so uh, i will go about uh, by sharing my presentation so i would just request you to just confirm that the screen is visible please go ahead for share screen sir Yes, sir. It's coming. Yeah, please go to the slides. Yeah, fine. Perfect. Okay. Is my voice audible to everyone? Yes, sir. Fine. Okay. Yeah, it's good, sir. Uh, so, gentlemen and ladies, uh, today's topic is emerging technologies on uh, low approach cooling towers and adiabatic coolers. So, the presentation uh, is divided in two parts primarily. Uh, the first part i will talk about the low approach uh, cooling towers and in the second part you can see i'll be talking about adiabatic coolers so in the first part we look at uh, certain key concepts uh, of cooling tower sizing which uh, i had discussed earlier in my presentation in 2021 uh, september 2021 so it's just a recap of those points because it's important to understand the key concepts and then move on Uh, to understand the low approach uh, cooling tower, uh, then we'll see power consumption trends, uh, the aspect of chill efficiency in terms of power consumption and its impact on uh, commercial buildings, and uh, an introduction to the low approach cooling tower. It's uh, uh, how it works and uh, case study on it, and what are the benefits that are arising from using a low approach cooling tower. In the second part, as I told you, we'll look at uh, adiabatic coolers and uh, before we go into adiabatic coolers we try to understand uh, the conventional systems of air cooled and water cooled systems and then i will introduce you to the adiabatic coolers the working principle and finally the benefits uh, and a small case study of the adiabatic cooler as well so this session would be uh, around 45 minutes so i just uh, want you all to uh, pay attention to the next 45 minutes and thereby if you have any questions you can always uh, you know collect them and uh, after the presentation is over i would uh, be willing to answer your queries as well so uh, we start with the first slide with the recap uh, of four key concepts of uh, cooling tower sizing the first important concept uh, about the cooling tower size is that if you have a wet bulb approach constant and if you increase the heat load of the process whether it's the heat load of a building or the heat load of industry then the cooling tower size will vary directly and linearly with the heat load so if you see in this graph uh, over here so if i have a unit tower size for a unit heat load if i double the heat load Uh, at the same approach, we double the size of the tower. So this is pretty straightforward, and I think most of us know about this. The second key point about the cooling tower size that it varies inversely with the range at a constant heat load and a constant approach. So if I have a cooling tower sized, say, over here with a range of say, a unit range. and if i increase the range keeping the heat load constant over here you can see that the tower size will come down so i increase the range by uh, say 20% and i see that the tower size has come down by almost 10% and vice versa so if i if i reduce the range over here by say 20% my tower size goes up by almost 10% so if you keep the heat load constant and you can simply reduce the range of your tower and reduce the flow rate or the mass flow of water you can reduce your tower size and what is the theory the reason behind this is that when you are increasing the range uh, the driving force uh, that is the enthalpy of the hot water 
and the entering wet well temperature enthalpy increases. So this increase in the driving force actually reduces uh, the tower size. The other important aspect by reducing the range, increasing the range, sorry, is uh, you are reducing the water flow and doing so, uh, the pressure drop that is incurred by the fan, the static pressure drop of the fan reduces, which means that you can reduce the size of the fan and you can reduce the size of your motor and you can reduce the size of your cooling tower as well. Third point about the size of the tower is the approach, which I think most of us are familiar with. So the tower size varies inversely with the approach. So higher the approach, smaller is the tower and vice versa. So we can see over here in this chart, say at 15 degree approach, approach that is the difference between the cooling water outlet temperature, the wet bulb temperature. If it is at 15 degree Fahrenheit, we have a unit size. If you reduce the approach by say five degree Fahrenheit, say this is almost like uh, one third, 33%, your cooling tower size has gone up by almost 50%. And if you reduce your low, uh, the approach by say 10 degree Fahrenheit, which is like uh, 66%, your cooling tower size has jumped to almost twice. So uh, this is a key concept to understand and which is important in the low approach cooling towers to be when we uh, look at the details. So at five degree approach or below, the effect of the cooling tower size becomes asymptomatic. So it's exponential. So it's not linear, but it becomes exponential. So if you reduce the approach, it becomes tougher to achieve the conditions. You need larger surface area to achieve the same amount of cooling water temperature. However, the low approach cooling towers can deliver an approach of one degree centigrade or 1.8 degree Fahrenheit with increase in tower size. How we do that is by increasing the tower size by almost two times the tower size, which is at the normal approach of say seven degree Fahrenheit. Fourth important concept in the cooling tower sizing is that the cooling tower size varies inversely with the wet bulb temperature. So keeping the heat load, the range and the approach constant. And if you reduce your wet bulb temperature, say if it is Delhi, we talk about say 83 degree Fahrenheit and we select a tower over here. And if we take the same tower to a place up north, maybe Himachal or maybe Jammu where the wet bulb is lower than Delhi, we see that the tower will not be able to deliver or will not be able to perform as per the required design temperature or duty condition because the air's ability to absorb moisture, you know, reduces as the temperature reduces. So these are four key concepts that one needs to keep in mind about tower sizing and the importance of tower sizing in low approach cooling towers. Next, we'll see uh, a typical uh, power consumption matrix in buildings. So we, we, most of us know that the HVAC consumes 80% of the total load of a building in a commercial space and balance 50% is by the lighting, electronic, and other appliances. And in the HVAC, the most important energy guzzler is the chiller. So the chiller would account for almost like 80% of the HVAC load. So if we have some means of improving the chiller efficiency or improving uh, reducing the chiller power consumption, then we can definitely reduce this HVAC load over here. So we are going to look at ways how the low approach cooling tower can actually help you reduce the chiller power consumption. So here is a low approach cooling tower. It's a counter flow design, as you can see. So low approach cooling towers can contribute in substantial energy saving. How? they can achieve a design approach of say one degree centigrade or 1.8 degree Fahrenheit. By doing so, they reduce the condenser water inlet temperature of the chiller, thereby improving the COP 
and reducing the IKW per turn of the chiller. So that is the way the low approach cooling tower can impact the energy consumption of the HVAC system of a building. Though the size and the initial cost of a low approach cooling tower is much higher than the standard cooling tower, which is of around five to seven degree approach, the additional cost of the cooling tower can be paid back in almost less than two years time. Here we see this graph whereby we are trying to map the performance of a chiller with respect to its incoming condenser water temperature. So if you look at a chiller which is operating at a condenser water inlet temperature of say at 90 degree Fahrenheit, we are close to around 0.62 kilowatts per ton energy consumption. And if you're able to bring this down to say 85, by using a low approach cooling tower, we come to around 0.56 IKW per ton. So we are saving almost 10 to 12% in energy by simply reducing the condenser water inlet temperature with the help of a low approach cooling tower. So we will look at a specific energy saving matrix to understand in detail the saving and techno-commercial aspect of using a low approach cooling tower. So we have taken two cases. The one case, the first case is based on the ASHRAE standard, energy standard, which is 90.1. And the other standard uh, case, we have taken the low approach cooling tower and we have compared the performance of both these uh, chillers. So in case of the ASHRAE standard 90.1, the design conditions laid down by ASHRAE is 95, incoming hot water for the cooling tower outlet is 85 and wet bulb is 75. So you can see that the approach is laid down by ASHRAE chapter 90.1 is around 10 degrees. So, and based on this, the consumption of a 550 ton chiller comes to around 311 kilowatts. Now, if we use a low approach cooling tower and we aim to achieve the say two degree Fahrenheit approach, then the outlet water from the cooling tower would be 77 instead of 85. And the incoming hot water temperature to the cooling tower will be 87. The range remains the same. So the range here is 10 degrees, the range over here is also 10 degrees. But here the approach you can see is from 10, has come down to two. So with this low temperature, low condenser water temperature entering into the chiller, we are able to reduce the power consumption of the entire chiller. So from 311, we had come into 259. This is almost, almost 51 kilowatts of energy. We have reduced by reducing the temperature of the condenser water. So in a nutshell, we see the saving of roughly 51 kilowatts and which accounts to around 17% reduction in the energy consumption of the chiller by using the low approach cooling tower. Now we look at a real case study for the low approach tower. And here we have taken the same capacity of 550 tons an energy cost of around 10 kilowatt hour, 10 rupees per kilowatt hour. And assuming that the chiller is working for 5,000 running hours per annum. These are the conditions, uh, standard uh, conditions for North India. We have considered this 83 Fahrenheit as the wet bulb and approach uh, we have taken of seven degree and a range of 10 degrees. So the additional cost, which is paid for the cooling tower, the low approach cooling tower capex is around 24 lakhs for a 550 TR chiller. And we compare the operational expense of the traditional tower and the low approach tower. For the seven degree approach, we are getting roughly 173 lakh as the running cost for this particular case. If you look at two degree approach, we get a running cost of 155 lakh. So there is a saving of roughly 18 lakhs by using a low approach cooling tower. And the extra cost that one had to pay is roughly 24 lakhs. So this extra cost can be recovered in 
less than one and a half years time. So you have a payback of roughly around 1.3 years. So if there is an extra cost of the no approach cooling tower that can be recovered easily within a span of less than two years time. So in nutshell, the benefits that arise from the low approach cooling tower, obviously energy savings, a high thermal specific performance in the range of 350 liters per minute per kilowatt, low drift losses, which is around 0.005% of the circulating water rate. The MOC 40% is reusable and is hence a sustainable product and an attractive payback of two years. So it not only helps to reduce your energy consumption, but helps you to earn green points, which will help you enable to certify your building as a green building. So uh, low approach cooling towers can actually help you earn around eight uh, green points, right? To, for your green building and which will help you to get the highest certification. Uh, now I would like to move uh, towards the second part of the presentation uh, where we will talk about adiaphatic coolers. Uh, they are different from uh, standard cooling towers and they, uh, they have a, a advantage over the cooling towers uh, through which one can understand the benefits of uh, the new technology. Now, to understand the benefits of uh, the adiabatic coolers, it is important to understand uh, the traditional uh, systems that are available in the market. So we look at a uh, water cool system over here. So we have three loops. So we have a, a condenser water loop, which is catering to the cooling towers. Then we have the chill water loop where the chiller is supplying chill water to the air handling unit. And then we have the chilled air loop where the air handler supplies the cold air to the heat load. Now in such a system, the water consumption of the cooling tower is comes to around eight to 10 liters per hour per ton of refrigeration. So uh, we all know that the cooling tower consumes roughly 1.2% uh, of circulating water flow rate, right? If we convert that in terms of liters, the thumb rule would be eight to 10 liters per hour per ton of refrigeration. So that is pretty high. The energy consumption uh, for this chiller would be close to 0.6 IKW per ton, or maybe slightly lower as well, because we have more efficient chillers available in the market. But I have taken a general uh, consumption of uh, chiller, which is around 0.6 IKW per ton. Now for a typical thousand ton water cool system, which is operating almost 8,000 hours per annum will consume roughly 78 to 80 million liters of water per annum. That is huge. And one can, you know, uh, water almost 11,000 trees in a year by the amount of water being consumed. So we are in a phase where, you know, in India, almost 60% businesses are affected with availability of water and their scarcity of water, specifically in the north and the northwestern parts of India. You can see the red regions over here, they are almost running dry. And there is a huge stress of water in these regions, whether it is Rajasthan, the parts of Gujarat, Punjab, and NCR. So it is all the more important that we look at technologies which can save water. And that is where the adiabatic coolers come into play. Well, before I go to adiabatic coolers, people would argue, why don't we use air cool systems instead of water cool systems? And we can get rid of the menace of water. So there is a drawback to the air cool system as well. So let's look how the air cool system works. We have got rid of the cooling tower over here Right, we put an air cool chiller, which is plug and play, and we just have two loops. We have the chill water loop and we have the air loop. So we can simply connect the 
chiller provide the chilled water to air handling unit and the air handling can provide chilled air to the heat load of the occupied space. But the problem with the air cool chiller is that it's consuming almost 1.2 kilowatts per ton, right? It is an energy guzzler. While the water cool chiller was consuming 0.6 kilowatts per ton, the air cool chiller is consuming something like double of it. It's almost 1.2 IKW per TR. So for a 1,000 ton, air cool system would consume almost 10 million kilowatts of energy per annum. And that much amount of energy you know, can serve almost 900 homes a year. So we get rid of the menace of water, but we are caught in the menace of energy consumption. So now to bridge the gap, that's where the adiabatic coolers come into play. So it's a fresh new alternative. It can save you up to about 40% energy as compared to an air cool chiller, and it can save you up to 80% of water consumption. So this is the beauty in the, of this technology of the adiabatic cooler. So adiabatic coolers are the fresh alternative to a water scarce and energy conscious industrial landscape. Now, how does it work? It's simply, it's an air-cooled heat exchanger. You have uh, two sets of coils which are arranged in a V-shape and you allow the uh, condenser water to flow into these coils coming from the chiller. And these uh, uh, fluids with this, within the coil can be cooled by the air which is sucked from here and is drawn out. And there is a pad in between where, which is used uh, to pre-cool the incoming dry air. So the adiabatic cooler uses the wetted pads to pre-cool the ambient air. So there are these cell evaporative pads which cool the incoming dry air and uh, they cool it uh, to almost 90% uh, of the difference between the dry bulb and the wet bulb temperature of that particular place. So you can get extremely cool air as close to the wet bulb temperature. And that cool air in turn cools the fluid within the coils. So this helps to achieve a lower temperature than the ambient dipole temperature. We all know that. And the heat rejection happening to, in case of adiabatic cooler, it's purely sensible. There is no latent cooling involved in case of adiabatic cooler. Unlike a cooling tower where Majority of the cooling happens to evaporative cooling, which is latent cooling, and a part of it happens to sensible. While adiabatic cooling, majority, the 100% of the cooling is happening through sensible cooling. <clears throat> so uh, if you look at the working principle, the pre-cooled air uh, achieves a far lower temperature risk than the dry bulb which is not possible in standard dry cooling systems. So we can achieve temperatures very close to the ambient wet bulb temperature and cool down the fluid within the coils and which in turn are exhausted through the fan. So you can see in this picture, the arrangement of the evaporative pads through which the cool air is cooled. And this part of the unit is where the coil is kept which is consisting of the fluid and that gets cools the fluid and the air picks up heat and then is exhausted through the fans. So there is an inbuilt system which regulates and optimizes the fan speed. And we can choose and select what type of system we want. Do we need a water saving system? For example, if we are based out of Rajasthan or maybe uh, somewhere in Gujarat where there is scarcity of water, we can look at configuring the, config, configuring the unit with respect to water saving. So uh, the, in that case, the fan will be running at the higher speed while uh, the water consumption will be minimized. So either way, if somebody is interested in having energy saving as the priority, then we can utilize pre-cooling effect to the maximum and minimize the power consumption by optimizing the fan speeds through a control panel. So from a performance perspective, the adiabatic coolers can achieve lesser cooling water temperatures lower than the cooling towers instead using as much 
lower water consumption. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, the cooler can be configured in two modes, the energy saving mode or the water saving mode, depending on the set point temperature. So if you are working in edge in energy saving mode, so your fan will be optimized and uh, the energy consumed will be minimized while the adiabatic cooling will be working at the maximum condition. While you, in case of a water saving mode, the pre-adiabatic, pre-cooling adiabatic feature will be reduced while the fan consumption would be maximized. So one can choose based on their requirements on what mode they want to operate the unit as. <clears throat> so one would naturally ask, uh, how does how does one incur so much of saving in water? Well, see the water coming out from the condenser of the chiller is moving into a closed circuit of the adiabatic cooler. So there are no evaporative losses happening. So if there are no evaporative losses, so there are no drifts happening, or there are no drift loss typically which you see in a cooling tower. And henceforth, there is no blowdown loss as such. So you do not require a chemical dosing system. You do not require a special treatment of the water, right? And you would not have any losses which are occurring due to evaporative cooling. All these put together enable us to reduce the water consumption of the circulating water to less than 80%. And we talk about 40% of energy savings how do we uncover 40% energy savings? So when we move from an air cool system to a water cool system, we know that the power consumption drops to almost 50% from 1.2 IKW to around 0.6 IKW per ton. And with the help of these fans, which are uh, electronic EC fans, you one can control the speed of the fan depending upon the load and they optimize the power consumption depending on the ambient temperature. So the net power consumption on an annual basis is reduced considerably. Further, if you have a water-rich environment, you can employ uh, and maximize the pre-cooling effect and lower down the speed of the fan and the power consumption of the fans. Similarly, in nighttime, one can also reduce the fan speed to a minimum and energize the pre-cooling mode or adiabatic cooling mode to reduce the temperature of the air. So these are various methods to which one can save almost 40% energy as compared to a conventional air cool system and almost 80% of water savings as compared to a water cool system. <coughs> now we look at a case study whereby we had uh, supplied uh, idiopathic coolers in a region which was scarce of water. So, the capacity of the cooling uh, adiabatic cooler was around 2600 TR. The energy cost was around 7.5 kilowatt hour. And the water cost was 9 pesa per liter. The additional capex uh, for the adiabatic cooler was around 6.6 .6 crore. The operating cost of the conventional cooling tower based system was around 21.35 crores. These are all annual figures. And the Operational cost for the adiabatic cooler system came to around 17.8. There was a net saving of around 3.55 crores by using the adiabatic cooler. So the extra cost that the client spent that was recovered in the gain less than two years. So this uh, saving which incurred 3.55 crores majorly came through the water saving of the cooling tower with respect to the cooling tower. So if you look at the consumption, the cooling tower used almost 204 million liters of water, while adiabatic cooler used only 50 million liters of water, saving almost 150 million liters of water, which is almost 75% saving of water. So this saving in water and the saving in electricity, both resulted in the saving of 3.55 CR for the customer. And he spent almost 6.6 .6 CR extra and recovered that extra cost in less than two years time. Finally, we'll look at some of the features of this uh, adiabatic 
cooler. It, as I told you in the beginning, it consists of two coils. These are high efficient heat transfer coils made of copper tube aluminum films, which are arranged in a corrugated fashion, maximizing the uh, heat transfer. Right, And on top of these are the fans. These are uh, compact EC fans with aerodynamic blade design, which minimize the noise level by almost eight to 10 dB as compared to a standard fan. And these uh, fans can be modulated based on the uh, input given to the control panel. And depending upon the load requirements, the speed of the fans can be modulated and matched uh, to, to the particular specific load. Apart from this, we have a smart control panel inbuilt, and this is uh, can be connected by uh, BMS to a Modbus or BACnet protocol. And we have a proprietary software logic inside this panel, which controls the speed of the fan over here, and also controls the amount of water being uh, percolated onto the cell deck, onto the evaporative cooling pads. So depending upon the uh, input sensor condition of the ambient air and the cooling water outlet temperature, we can uh, choose to control uh, the speed of the fan and we can choose to control the amount of water being circulated on the adiabatic pads. <clears throat> and lastly, we do not have accumulation of water since this is a closed circuit and the water coming from the condenser of the chiller is in a closed circuit, closed loop. It is not, uh, it is not exposed to the atmosphere. It does not fall into a basin or does not accumulate or is not stagnated. And so the possibility of Legionella formulation is virtually zero in this case. So Legionella is basically a virus which develops into stagnated water and typically in traditional cooling towers, which have a basin and for a stagnated water, they, you can have possibility of a regional virus being developed, which may cause pneumonia. So we get rid of all those problems and we also get rid of any scaling effect, which happens uh, into the circulating water because the increased TDS in case of a traditional cooling tower, we have the water which circulates in a closed loop and comes back into the condenser water in a closed loop. So Virtually, uh, you're, there is no treatment required. The water remains clean and isolated from the external atmosphere. And uh, <coughs> uh, uh, the other important aspect is it is a plug and play unit, which means that the unit is uh, fitted in, with the control panel with all the internal piping and internal wiring done. So when it comes to the site, one can just simply install it on a foundation and connect it with the uh, incoming supply and the condenser water uh, circuit and start the unit directly. So the installation cost is extremely uh, nil. It's actually nil. There is no installation cost access. You just have to keep it connected with the incoming supply and the incoming water it's a water circuit and start the unit. It will and select the type of mode that you want to operate it and it will be working at its own pace. So these are the benefits of the adiabatic cooler and just summarize it in this particular slide. Uh, just for everybody's view, uh, the water saving as we have discussed, the range of 70 to 80% as compared to cooling towers. Energy savings to the tune of 40% as compared to the air cool systems. Durability uh, is extremely high. The expected product life is around 10 years. Low maintenance, uh, being a closed circuit, idiopathic cooler uh, can be connected to BMS and fully automated system based on the control logic that one selects. And, uh, as I discussed, there is no risk of Legionella colonization. It is lightweight, low noise. It is driven by acoustically efficient fans and can be modulated 
depending upon the demand requirement and can be matched. Plug and play, as we have discussed, fully assembled, no site erection time, easy to replace, and no major downtime. Sub foundation support units can be placed on flat and concrete surfaces directly. So these are the benefits of the adiabatic cooler. With this, I come to the end of my presentation. If you have any questions, I'm uh, here to reply back. Uh, thank you very much, sir. It was such a great session, I would say. So, few questions are there in a QA session. Should I read one by one or you will take it? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, somebody uh, has asked this question. Okay, uh, uh, water consumption of eight to ten liters per hour per ton. Yes, it includes uh, blowdown loss. So basically, three losses are there in the cooling tower: evaporative losses, uh, drift losses, and the blowdown loss. All put together, uh, add to eight to ten liters per hour per ton of refrigeration. Not per hour. This is per ton of refrigeration. Okay, the next question, uh, Mr. Prakash, how corrosion is addressed in adiabatic cooling to condenser or chiller? Now, uh, as I told you, this is a closed circuit. So uh, the water is isolated and is not uh, exposed to atmosphere. As such, you do not require any specific treatment for corrosion. It is just like a chilled water circuit, which is you know isolated and which operates in a closed system. Similarly, uh, in an adiabatic cooler, on the condenser side, you have the condenser water which is flowing in a closed circuit. Somebody has said, uh, can we replace the existing chiller cooling tower with, uh, yes, we can replace, definitely. Uh, the important factor to see with the low approach tower is the space requirement. As I told you, uh, if you reduce the space, if you reduce the approach of the tower, say from 5 degree Fahrenheit to Two degree or three degree Fahrenheit, the size of the tower will, be, will become two x. So you need to see that you have enough space uh, to have a low approach cooling tower. Space is the important criteria. How will you rate the performance of adiabatic coolers in area like Chennai? Yeah, good question. Uh, we, as a company, have installed uh, adiabatic cooler in uh, one of the customers based out of Chennai. And uh, in spite of that low wet bulb depression, we see there is a tremendous energy saving and water saving by using the adiabatic cooler. We can work out uh, the exact uh, duty conditions and saving for your particular requirement and share with you. So, uh, the wet bulb depression actually is not going to remain the same throughout the year, but it's dynamic in nature. So at times you would be saving a lot of water, at times you will not be saving water. But if you look at the analyzed consumption of water, that will be significantly lower as compared to that of a cooling tower if you compare it to the adiabatic cooler. And you will still be able to manage uh, payback of around two years or so. Is there any preferred range for outside temperature and humidity use? Uh, outside temperature and humidity. No, there is no preferred range as such. So even if it is a, a drier climate, I can only say as a generic uh, comment that if drier the climate, the better will be the performance of the adiabatic cooler. So regions like, uh, you know, uh, Gulf regions or maybe areas which are close to the desert will have a better performance of the adiabatic cooler because of the difference between the uh, dry bulb and the wet bulb temperature. Mr. Avinesh, uh, thanks for the. Is there a. Yeah, typically uh, it is in the range of one to three liters uh, per hour per ton. Just like I told you for a standard cooling tower, the, power, the water consumption is close to eight to 10 liters per hour per ton. Uh, for adiabatic cooler, it should be in the range of one to three liters 
per hour per ton of refrigeration. However, this is generic. If in order to find the actual anodized consumption, you will have to uh, share us the actual uh, data and duty point conditions based on which we can do a mapping, analyzed mapping, and we can tell you the exact amount of water that you will be incurring for adiabatic cooler. Is there any chiller capacity limit for adiabatic coolers? Uh, yes. Uh, in the sense, uh, these are modular units, so they are in the range of around 250 TR. So they, these are plug and play units, uh, which are manufactured in uh, modules. So maximum limit as of now that we have is around 250 ton. So if you have higher than that, we will have to have two, uh, two adiabatic coolers for one chiller. Is MOC for low approach towers, so conventional cooling towers? MOC is more or less same. There is no uh, much difference in the MOC. It's only the size of the cooling tower increases. Mr. Koshle, the sustainable and yeah, sustainable MOC in the sense that the material that we are using is sustainable, uh, can be recycled. And that is why I am using the word sustainable NMOC, which will enable you uh, to get lead points for your uh, certified, green certified building. Mr. Kamal. Yes, certainly adiabatic coolers are efficient as we avoid pumps and fouling in a relatively better efficient way. Yes. So the fouling and scaling in a closed system obviously will be much lower as compared to an open system. So your life of the chiller and the life of the pump would definitely much higher in case of adiabatic cooler. Not only life, actually the power consumption for your cooler, uh, for your uh, condenser water pump is going to be lesser for adiabatic cooler because it does not take into consideration the head of the standard cooling tower. Because in a standard cooling tower pump, you need to have the static head to calculate the total pressure drop of the condenser water pump. So it includes the pipe pressure drop as well as the static pressure drop, that is the height of the tower. While in case of the adiabatic cooler, it being a closed circuit, it does not have the static pressure drop and hence uh, the pump size in case of uh, adiabatic cooler would be much smaller. Will adiabatic coolers, yes, they can definitely run in areas like Chennai. I've already explained earlier. or process requiring constant temperature. Yeah, uh, this is a good question, Mr. Loya. Uh, process requirement 31. Uh, see, in such a case, the program logic for the adiabatic cooler is in such a way, uh, uh, it senses the outlet temperature of the adiabatic cooler based on which it controls both the adiabatic cooling as well as the fan speed. So first we will run it in a dry mode, the fans, and it can work adiabatic cooler. The beauty of adiabatic coolers, it can work in three modes. It can work in a dry mode, it can work in dry and wet mode, and it can work in completely wet mode. So what we do is depending upon the uh, temperature being sensed, uh, we run the fans initially in the dry mode and we maximize the heat transfer through the fans. But if still you are not able to achieve a temperature of 31 degree, then we switch on the adiabatic cooling pads. So there are, as I told you, two coils. So the first coil is started and we see there would be a decrease in temperature of the air through that reduction in the adiabatic cooling. And even after that, if it doesn't, then we start the second coil and we have the second adiabatic cooling started. So uh, by doing both the adiabatic cooling pads and the fans running at the maximum speed, we will achieve the temperature of 31 degree. So that is possible, but ideally, we look at 32 degree as the outlet temperature for adiabatic coolers. <clears throat> okay, Mr. Tavinesh, how do we compare the space requirements within cooling tower? Uh, yeah, uh, space requirements, uh, see there are modular units. So depending on uh, specific tonnage, as I told you, uh, you would require more number of units in case of adiabatic coolers compared to a cooling tower, because a cooling tower can be sized a single tower. Uh, for example, part for we have a single tower which can give you thousand tons of refrigeration. But then adiabatic coolers 
the limit, as I told you, is close to 250 TR. So you need four of these to, uh, to cater to a 1,000 TR plant. <clears throat> so is the performance of the ATV mainly based on wet bulb or dry bulb, which is more advantage for the system? So it depends and the differential between the dry bulb and the wet bulb, the depression of the dry bulb and wet bulb, that is the performance of the cooling. Because it is based on sensible cooling, it has nothing to do with the latent cooling. How many adiabatic towers? We have almost like uh, 10 installations in India, uh, from uh, whereby Pahadpur has supplied uh, cooling towers in data centers, uh, in commercial spaces, and in industries as well. Generally, adiabatic coolers are water, water space, which are cautionary. However, for industries having intensive use of water doing tertiary treatment of cooling solution, cooling towers, zero discharge. Yeah. Uh, I have to uh, specifically see this condition, which you mentioned that uh, there is a effluent treatment of water. So uh, we will need to study what our exact requirements are. Then only we can come back to you. What is uh, the uh, benefit of adiabatic coolers in uh, your process industry? Certainly, it is a good area to look at because you mentioned that there's a huge requirement uh, and uh, intensive use of water. And we can look at substituting that with the adiabatic coolers. Uh, I would suggest if you can send us uh, an inquiry to this requirement, then we can work out uh, a, the right solution for you through the adiabatic coolers. Last question through Mr. Kashlender. What is the overall commercial impact of using? Uh, the impact of using EC fans uh, is definitely first EC fans are standardized fans. They are DC run fans. They can be optimized uh, depending upon the load. They are low noise fans. So depending, they can match the load requirements. So unlike a standard cooling tower fan, which is working almost at constant speed, these EC fan motors are highly efficient motor fans, which almost 90%, uh, more than 95% of efficiency. And they can be modulated uh, uh, as per the load requirements, exactly to match the lo load requirements. The beauty of the EC fans is that. And uh, they, they give you a better chance to uh, you know, operate the whole system as such. Unlike uh, cooling tower where it has a single fan which is using working on a constant speed. So uh, one can naturally uh, mix and match. Or like the like the uh, what is the overall impact? So this is uh, difficult to tell you. What is the impact on the footprint size, Mr. Koshlender, uh, for the adiabatic cooler? It depends on your duty condition. What are the exact requirements? Then only we can do uh, comparison. But I told you in general, these are modular units and. Uh, these modular units uh, have a limited capacity of around 250 tons. So if your requirements are larger than 250 tons, we'll have to use uh, two numbers or three numbers uh, to match the uh, process requirements. Okay, so I think uh, that answers most of the questions, uh, Tapas. Yeah, of course, sir. I think all the question has been well taken and uh, uh, so many question has been asked that shows that how audience are involved for this webinar. So thank you very much, sir. I mean, uh, I, you can share my mail ID. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm just writing on the chat box your email ID so that uh, further they can ask you directly or they can send back to us also for any question uh, in info at dcstate.org. Yeah. Anyway, I am uh, just sending the email address of yours in the chat box or uh, everybody is requested for the to note down this email ID. Yeah. 
that is send uh, send it from chat box that is sahab dot amat at uh, parpur dot com. So hope everybody has been on that particular email ID. Or as I said, if there are two minutes, you can send back to us any feedback or anything else related to the program. Info at dcsa.org as well. So I think we are with the time almost. And uh, uh, coming to the end, I further request our program chair, Valiullah Siddhi, sir, to make a word of thanks for this session. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Tapas. So it was an excellent session. And I congratulate Mr. Shahab Ahmed also for such excellent session that he has delivered. And we were, uh, there was a lot of uh, people's questions in queries regarding how we can optimize the cooling towers. What are the, you know, the new trends in cooling towers. So this session uh, of this webinar was in that line to, you know, give you the insights into the technical, technological changes that are happening in the cooling tower industry and the, how the cooling towers are evolving. Because, uh, you know, broadly, if you see our air conditioning systems, we have uh, broadly two kinds of air conditioning systems, especially in the bigger range when we talk about chillers. One is the water cooled system and one is the air cooled system. So, both of these systems, uh, we face challenges because as a resource, the water is also become very precious. So, we can't, uh, you, we don't have much water also to use and then saving energy again is a, is a challenge for us. So for the bigger system, since the chilling plant was more efficient on water cool system. So the water was available in abundance. We used to use that, you know, earlier if you see or most of the plants, they were water cooled and uh, we were using cooling towers. Then uh, the water is becoming Precious is became a scarce, so we uh, go for air cooled system. So for air cooled, as uh, Mr. Ahmed very uh, rightly explained, if you use the adiabatic coolers, we can save the energy as well as water. So for green building design, we need to save water as well as energy. And uh, with this uh, techn technological advance. Uh, cooling towers with the, which fall into the sustainable project and sustainable equipment category in the green building series. So we can achieve uh, green building points and we can uh, save our natural resources. We can have more efficient system and uh, technologically more advanced things. So it's been very nice and uh, uh, people have been uh, very curious by the questions that, that has come the way and the way you have answered them. Uh, we see that the curiosity of the people who are attending the seminar and the webinar and uh, any further questions if you require, certainly it will be answered. And uh, we'd, also, we'd also like to know about a, a, any interest or any topic that you would like to take us further on that. So with this, uh, I thank everybody, Mr. Shahab Ahmed, our secretary team, all the participants for enthusiastically attending it and uh, our partners for supporting us arrange such webinars and workshops and say knowledge sessions. So thanks everybody. So uh, thank you very much, sir. So uh, with your kind permission, uh, should we close this? Yeah. Yeah, I think we yeah. close. Uh, we are through with this now. Yeah, thank Thanks you very much. much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you for uh, having us. Uh, best wishes.